any issues with that. Um, and then if I, for whatever reason, uh, happen to pop off and get frozen out, uh, Max is going to jump in and facilitate if need be. Um, but uh, again, this thank you all for being here. Um, uh, this is the collaboration of the Bay Area Hospitality Group, uh, a networking opportunity that I had hosted at the Julia Morgan Ballroom, the Merchants Exchange Club, um, and our restaurant Credo as a way to showcase our spaces uh, to the hotel sales, catering, convention service uh, community, as well as SF Travel and some planners and such. And then the SF UVA, which is the San Francisco Unique Venue Alliance uh, for venues uh, not affiliated with hotels. Um, which had a educational aspect in our networking opportunities. Um, so as, as a way to keep, enter into 21, I had asked some folks from uh, Rodney Fong from the chamber and then Julie Van Holt uh, from SF Travel to give us sort of an, a hospitality update and then following their update uh, and we will have a Q&A and a conversation. Um, but I would like to introduce uh, Rodney Fong, who has been with SF Chamber for two years uh, and has had, along with SF Travel, some of the hardest years uh, since 1906, I would believe, for San Francisco to navigate and try to bring back uh, the city uh, from uh, destruction. So I would like to introduce Rodney uh, to all of you folks. Great, thank you, Mike, and nice to see everybody. Some very familiar faces. Uh, the, this is the whole group that I know if we were all together, we'd be uh, probably hanging out at the bar or <clears throat> fighting over the Chardonnay, and I can't wait for that to all come back. So I uh, miss everybody. Um, let me try to, since SF Travels here, try to talk a little bit about hotels, a little bit about restaurants, but really kind of give you an overview of where the rest of the business community, your customers, our customers are. Really quickly though, um, I grew up in the hospitality uh, field. I went to City College Hotel and Restaurant Management. Um, we, our family business was the Wax Museum at Fisherman's Wharf and literally grew up as a small kid uh, working in the Wax Museum, bringing Frankenstein's head uh, down Fisherman's Wharf on Jefferson Street and having tourists look very strangely at me. And it did to me as a kid, that just seemed like my, my normal job and uh, nothing strange. Um, <clears throat> but it really began to understand the importance of tourism. Uh, not only for our family business, but how it supports the entire city. And we are now more than ever evident that we're missing 25.8 million people this year. And people wonder why the streets of San Francisco is quiet. People wonder why downtown is quiet. Obviously you take away 25 million people and you're gonna feel that. Um, but when we're criticized for that, and, and you know, there's been so many negative things about San Francisco, I remind everyone also that we've been doing our job in sheltering in place. And it's supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be quiet. Uh, and so our COVID numbers really reflect, I think, that success. So we all, I believe, owe ourselves a little bit of a pat on the back, although I know it's difficult from an economic perspective. The hotels, as you know, um, most of them are, are remain closed. Uh, we had a conversation with uh, Moscone yesterday. And Everyone else, everyone on this call knows, but I'll, I'll point out the direct relationship Moscone has with the hotels, the hotel tax collection, the rates in which uh, Moscone is able in, in to book advanced conventions and how that fills hotels. I know, I know I'm seeing the obvious, but it's a really clear connection of those two symbiotic relationships and how they need to feed each other. Moscone, as, as you probably have heard, is, hasn't gotten the clear directive from the state health department as to how many people we can put into a room, uh, if they need to be six feet apart, three feet masked apart, uh, et cetera. And so there's real question about uh, what can come into Moscone Center in the future. Uh, Bob Sauter had, had mentioned that he thought that it would be till uh, <clears throat> 2024 for full activation of Moscone Center. Now that has a lot to do with um, the cycle in which Moscone conventions are booked. And, and you guys know that the, they swing back and forth between the East Coast, West Coast, every other year, every third year. And once we get out of that cycle, it takes a while to, to lag and get back into that cycle. So very well, the city could be bustling and doing very well with local tourism, but our convention business might have that lag, that sort of turbo lag uh, um, uh, to catch up. Um, in the meantime, there may be some other one-off things that San Francisco, quite frankly, turned away. Uh, whether they were uh, smaller uh, sporting events, whether they were festivals that maybe uh, were too expensive for San Francisco and the hotel room rates uh, were, were not compatible or were too high for, uh, I don't know, the, the, 
the Cheerleaders Association Championship of the World. Uh, those thing, kinds of things, fun things that we didn't see in San Francisco. I think our hotel rates will probably drop for a little while so that uh, we might be able to accommodate some of those types of activities. On the restaurant side, <clears throat> we all know that the restaurants are still 50% behind. Some of them have been lucky enough to pick up uh, the outdoor dining. But as you've been around, uh, it's, it's mostly outdoors and mostly on weekends. And so we need to have that well-rounded um, piece of business. And, and we always say, you know, support local. I'm going a bit further and say, saying support local on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and stay home on the weekend and let them enjoy uh, seven days of full business. There is a movement <clears throat> to extend permanently the parklet, the uh, shared space programs, which I think would be great. Uh, the chamber is pushing obviously for that. Uh, I want to make sure that we that have, we have um, and we've always wanted this, right? We've always wanted the Europeanization of San Francisco. We've always wanted to use our streets, share our streets. But the indoor is still very important. The indoor is still very important for a lot of reasons, like, like the event venue business. Um, and so regulating that, designing the streets to have some parklets, but some open space, some music outside, but still really inviting people into the interiors of buildings is still very important. Um, we probably are going to see a significant number of restaurants that don't make it, that don't open up. Um, this is going to be difficult for, for a lot of folks. The ones I think who probably survive are going to do quite well. Um, just the competitive pool is probably going to be smaller. And, and to be honest, before COVID, there were so many restaurant choices. Uh, you know, there was a lot of competition. And, and I think all of us could have eaten in a five-star restaurant uh, 15 nights in a row and never never touch the same restaurant twice. And so um, San Francisco, I believe overall, is gonna be looking at quali quality over quantity. We are gonna be a, maybe a smaller community, which is not bad. We're gonna have maybe fewer choices, but the quality is probably gonna be better looking for that repeat business. You know, in the restaurant business, it's a, you know, the quality of food is always much higher when there's a higher repeat uh, rate versus a new customer every time in a, in a high tourist area. So hopefully we get that repeat piece. I'm, I'm hoping that all of you uh, through this have, have picked up some, some positives of COVID. And maybe some of that is uh, getting to your, your neighbors a little bit better. Uh, I think San Francisco is paring down in size. Uh, there's estimates of somewhere between 50 and 100,000 people who have left San Francisco. Today's Chronicle actually shows they didn't go to Austin, they didn't go to Miami, but in fact, they went to um, the outer counties of California, Alameda, uh, the South, South Bay, Santa Cruz. And so all of those people, I think, are still within the region. Maybe they've left San Francisco per se, but they will be back. Um, the downtown and <clears throat> um, financial district in Soma, obviously the most hit. Uh, there is a, a, a genuine exodus of, of some tech uh, businesses leaving San Francisco that is of concern. Uh, those for you who are in the event world or in the catering world, these were many of your clients. Um, however, uh, there is a number of, and I was surprised at this when I uh, came into the chamber, the number of middle-sized businesses that are anywhere from 700 to 1,000 people, employees, that you've never heard of before. I'd never heard of them. I couldn't pronounce their names. But all of them are here. A lot of them are here, and they're very stealthy, and they don't want them to be known for competitive reasons. These are, this is the category of business that I believe the chamber, you and I all really need to try to focus on and support because they are gonna grow in San Francisco. They are staying. Maybe some of them are gonna expand. Maybe some of them are gonna be the next Oracle, or the next Airbnb. And so we really wanna make sure we're fostering and, and retaining those types of businesses here in San Francisco. Because San Francisco's downtown may not be bustling the way it was with uh, people come in seven days a week, um, I think it's incumbent upon us as San Franciscans to begin to use the downtown. And if you can, you know, use it and treat it as a neighborhood. Uh, the restaurants that do reopen, I think that we also try to use them from our business perspective. If we can push um, a, a venue activity like the Julia Morgan Ballroom, that's important that we try to all focus a little bit as we can to focus back at the downtown. Um, I want to wrap it and maybe just open it up to questions, but just give you a little bit overview of what the Chamber of Commerce does, because people are a little bit unsure sometimes. Uh, we are not affiliated with the San Francisco government or any government in any way. We are a nonprofit, just like KQED, a membership-driven organization. We represent thousands of members, big and small, from your biggest company down to your mom and pop shoe, shoe shop. 
Uh, we therefore, because, because of that wide range and scope of businesses, uh, we advocate from businesses on a whole different levels. So sometimes it is environmental things that we're speaking about. Sometimes I just got off the call of the Historic Preservation Commission advocating to keep the Ferris wheel in Golden Gate Park the, uh, to, to supporting small business measures here in the city. Uh, we have mixers and events that you can attend. Some of them all are online right now, but of course, when we get back, they're, they're great fun parties to attend. And then we have different seminars uh, and webinars uh, giving the state of the city. Uh, the last thing I want to close on, which is probably the most important thing, the quality of life of San Francisco on the streets. If we don't address that now at this really strange juncture in time, San Francisco will never fully recover. And so it's so important that all of us focus in and don't leave it to somebody else to help solve the streets, the problems on the streets. I think the city has been known as a compassionate city and the way we are treating and handling the streets of San Francisco is the least compassionate way. I can't believe I'm stepping over somebody on the way uh, down the sidewalk, that's just inhumane. So um, help us if we can try to change the narrative, change how money is spent San Francisco has a $13.8 billion, with a B, billion dollar budget that is bigger than six other states in, in America. And we have the resources to do this. We need the political will to make that change. And it's gonna come from you, because it come from us. Those who haven't left San Francisco, those that haven't gone to Texas, those that haven't gone to New Mexico, those who stayed in San Francisco are gonna make it work, it's up to us. So please join us, get involved, join the Chamber of Commerce, sfchamber.com is our website. Uh, email me directly and we'd love to, to show force of how important this great city is and we're going to bounce back and it's going to be better than ever if we all step forward. So thank you. I think I'm pretty close to time and uh, happy to ask answer any questions. All righty. Thank you, Rodney. We will uh, come back and uh, have some questions after we get to Julie Van Holt uh, with SF uh, Travel. <clears throat> Julie. Hi. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm stepping in for Zeke here, so I think I've got my notes ready, and uh, Rodney um, opened the door for me on quite a few similar topics, so that's that's awesome. Uh, we're definitely singing the same tune, um, but we're San Francisco Travel, for those of you that don't know, we are also a membership um, partner-based organization. Um, a lot of our funding also comes from hotel tax, and, um, you know, we're we're definitely suffering as everybody else is by not having that uh, revenue income. We're down about 70% of our company now. So we're lean and mean. Um, we're really working to keep programs in place. Um, we're you know, in touch with customers and really setting new strategies, you know, every week. Um, I would say currently, you know, we're in that time right now where like you all, we want to salvage business and we want to know when can business come back and, you know, kind of be ready for it. So, you know, as we're working through that and waiting to hear from the state and also the city on what timeline we have to, for hotels to open to small meetings, for your venues to open to small meetings, um, and then eventually Moscone Center. Um, we're really in a crunch time right now to salvage, um, I would say any self-contained or venue type events starting around the June timeframe. And I don't have to tell you all this, but you know, smaller meetings that need maybe a 40 to 60, maybe 90 days at minimum uh, planning cycle, they're going to need to know in the coming weeks if they can operate this summer. So we're a little on pins and needles, hoping to hear something soon, not really expecting it in the next you know, couple of weeks. Um, so we are planning on that. Uh, we have a lot of self-contained groups still on the books um, May through December of this year. We've been doing a lot of moving of groups, obviously. Um, throughout the first quarter, we've moved a lot of groups later into second quarter. Some of them have moved into 2022 now. Um, you know, we're just kind of taking it day by day on the self-contained side. On the citywide side, um, if we can operate groups in early Q3, we will feel really fortunate. Um, we do have groups still on the books, uh, June, um, July, a couple in August. Everyone's just sort of waiting in the wings. Um, I would say for a September and beyond group to operate, 
they're really going to need to know by around April 1st if they can operate in the fall, um, approximately what those parameters are going to be before they'll start pulling triggers on fall business to decide if they're going virtual um, or in, you know, we're kind of fearing in some cases, we do expect to lose some groups, both citywide or self-contained, possibly to other cities that are opening before we are. So um, I don't want to be the Debbie Downer, but that is, you know, it's definitely a reality. I mean, we're all hearing of, you know, Florida, Las Vegas is getting ready to do some operating, um, Arizona hotels are doing some operating on groups. So um, we're doing everything we can, you know, to get groups to hang on and to, you know, be able to stay with us and, and operate when they're here. So that said, we don't have control over the timing, but um, what we are doing is keeping in touch with everyone. Um, the Our Gate is Open campaign um, had been put on pause, still is paused um, right now. We expect as soon as um, the 10 day quarantine is lifted and we can also start accepting, you know, um, leisure tourism from outside the 10 Bay Area counties. We expect that campaign to start up again with a calling all California um, type of theme that's in conjunction with Visit California. So I do expect advertising for local tourism and you know, regional tourism to start up hopefully within the coming weeks. Um, that should help some of our restaurant partners, some of our um, attractions and um, you know, start kind of laying the groundwork for you know where we need to be, um, on the you know also on the advertising side, um, I would say international travel, which I know a lot of our partners and a lot of you depend on. Um, of course, we don't expect that to come back as quickly, um, but we are working on campaigns right now for international tourism. Once those um, you know thoroughfares and flight paths and things start opening up. Um, what else can I tell you? I would say on the Moscone side, um, we're definitely still moving groups, as I said. Um, we've got some summer groups that are considering fall dates, um, you know, in, time, in a time period they wouldn't normally consider, um, but they really are trying to get some of these groups to operate. Um, every group that cancels, we talk to them about confirming a future year. So we are still trying to advance business, get you know future business on the books. I mean, when you look at our um, calendar for really 22 and beyond, we are pretty solid still. Um, we do have some openings where we can you know try to squeeze in some of these groups, and we're you know we're doing what we can. Um, we do also expect at least for the next two, maybe three years, a lot of these citywide groups, especially, are going to be downsized. Um, you know, virtual components are coming into play, um, lack of interest possibly in travel um, for some of these business um, travel folks in the next, say, six to 12 months. So we do expect um, the virtual portion of meetings to um, eat away a little bit at attendance. But I do feel, um, I mean, I do feel strongly that we're, we're still going to bounce back. We're going to have great Moscone shows. We're going to be bringing a lot of people into the city. Um, you know, we just have to get to that point where we can open. Um, and then kind of to echo Rodney, you know, we're making plans also for once we are completely open, um, you know, the advertising's flowing, we're starting to get groups to come back in. You know, we, we are going to be going back to two of our and I would say where our main concerns for planners in booking groups um, prior to COVID, and that is street conditions, as Rodney alluded to, um, and also the cost of doing business in San Francisco. Um, I would say we've seen some hotel rates drop, at least for you know, inside the 2021, 2022 timeframe. Um, but you know, considering our position to other cities, we are still pretty high. Um, labor is expensive in San Francisco for groups that are operating heavy labor shows um, compared to other cities. And I don't expect that that's going to be changing. Um, you know, there's so many great reasons for these groups to book in San Francisco. They have high attendance, which is the reason a lot of these annuals continue to come back again year after year after year. 
So, um, you know, if we can just continue as a community to work on these other issues, you know, mostly street conditions and, you know, what we're doing as far as influencing where money's spent, what kind of programs are going in place, um, you know, it's really important not only for those individuals who, you know, are not as fortunate as we are, but also for the residents of San Francisco and for our guests coming in. So we spend a lot of time talking about it, a lot of time on how we can overcome it um, and present a, um, a wonderful city to, for our you know, attendees to experience. So that I would say will continue, um, probably more to follow on that. Um, any questions? like I'm rambling a little bit. So I'm gonna see if anybody has any questions. So uh, I, I have questions for either Julie or Rodney uh, and you can, in the participant, if you hit participants, there should be a raise hand feature um, and hit uh, your raised hand or uh, just go ahead and jump in at the moment since we don't have any raised hands. If we have any questions, uh, please uh, jump in and ask either Julie or Rodney at this time. Hey, Julie, it's uh, Christy. I just have a, um, a question on what you think the long-term impact of virtual meeting attendance is going to be. I know it's anybody's best guess, mm -hmm. but I'm just curious, what is the conversation inside SF Travel for, say, what is the three-year impact? What mm -hmm. are you all thinking? Yeah, that is the question of the day. Um, I participated in a think tank with UCSF on this topic a couple of weeks ago, and um, I was kind of surprised the opinions are very broad. Um, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been that surprised, but um, I mean, we do feel the next 18 to 24 months virtual is going to have an impact. Um, it really does depend on segment of business, though. Mm -hmm. uh, we you know, corporate business, especially tech, because we get so much tech business in this, you know, area, mm -hmm. um, they are able to really flip the switch much quicker and bring in a virtual component um, that they're able to monetize. Um, they get good attendance. They've had, um, you know, increased attendance in some of their shows over the last year mm -hmm. on this virtual, you know, component anyway. Um, and they have the funding to really allocate what they need to pull off these virtual portions or hybrid portions. So I think we'll continue to see that, especially in the next you know, 12 to 18 months on the corporate and on the tech side. Um, more on the association side, whether it's hotel business or citywide business, they don't like it as much. I mean, there's there's definitely some benefit for a hybrid or you know some virtual portions of conferences, but associations really are not enabled. They just don't have the funding for the AV requirements, um, the manpower that it takes, the marketing, you know, up front and on the back end. Um, I, I think we'll you know it's just going to depend by segment, but I would really keep an eye on some of these corporate groups especially. Other questions? Right, I have a quick question, actually. Um, Julie, maybe may more directed at Bob and the Moscone team, but can you talk about like any like adjustments being made to Moscone to account for like what meetings, conferences might look like in the future if they're smaller groups and their live streams or, or that sort of thing? Yeah, good question. Thank you for asking. Um, we did re actually pre-COVID, you know, right before, we did revise parameters for Moscone Center. So um, for those of you that don't know, um, we do have a peak room requirement. So peak guest rooms or hotel rooms that are required um, for a group to qualify for Moscone. And you know, if they're using three buildings, it would, of course, be higher than if they were using one or two buildings. So, um, you know, we've enjoyed a, a good hefty capacity at Moscone over the years, and we've been able to really command high peak room um, requirements. But we did make some adjustments on that in late 2019. Um, we're still doing that as far as looking at the West Building. So 
We are taking um, inquiry on smaller groups now than we would normally take um, for the West Building in particular. It's really good for groups that typically would be in a maybe a large hotel type of setting in another city um, that need to move into a convention center um, type scenario. So we are looking at more of those. We've booked um, several and I think we can probably continue to see that into the future. They are more short-term bookings, so they tend to be anywhere from 12 months to about three years out, which is you know, more of a, a filler time. Um, so I think that we'll continue to see you know, work in that area. All right, and I had a question actually for both uh, Rodney and Julie. Uh, the programs that you used to offer um, you'd come in and it would be a, a, you'd present to the team sort of uh, like the different segments uh, and, and both the chamber uh, and SF Travel had member events uh, to kind of educate folks. Now, is there still that component available or other things that the folks on the uh, line can uh, uh, get involved in virtually? Yeah, uh, from the chamber side, we are doing probably four events a week. Um, so check out the, the schedule events. They are uh, very specific things talking to the legal community, which would love to have you there and, and sharing your services, talking to biotech, um, talking to fintech, and also doing some general networking opportunities. So uh, if you can check it out, there's, there's certainly ways to plug in. I, I will say, I know this is the most difficult time to try to network and meet with anybody, but uh, we've tried to try to uh, jump that hurdle and create uh, you know, breakout rooms and opportunities for people to connect. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, that's definitely an area that we're missing. Um, most of our, oh, did I lose you guys? Oh, did I lose you? Oh, sorry, I thought my, I thought I froze. Um, you know, we're definitely missing those partner opportunities. Um, we are um, on the sales side, we have been meeting with some hotels um, throughout the months, um, some venues throughout the months as well. It's more of kind of a one-off. So um, if you have something that you, you know, that you can share and talk about now as, as we kind of start to open up, um, just maybe shoot an email to myself or Zeke and we'll get you on the schedule. We've been trying to schedule you know, one or two a week and kind of have more of a one-on-one -on -one time versus a large partnership type you know, event setting um, because our staff is so small right now. So it does really help us to know um, kind of what venues and hotels are doing or how you're preparing you know, when we do open back up. Um, it helps us to know who's on staff and you know, we're still sending leads and, and inquiries. So it, it's just good to have that face time and, and know who we're working with. Thank you. I had a question. I'm just going to jump in. It's Samantha from City Hall. Um, it's for Rodney. I know. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and all your words, and also to Julie too, and to Mike. Um, but I, I had a question. Hopefully, I, um, I, was, I didn't miss this. But you talked about kind of the state of the streets, um, and I'm and and you mentioned kind of needing support from this group or, or different venues or different businesses. And I'm just wondering if there is some plan um, about what we can do as venues um, or just as people in San Francisco or kind of what the chamber's view on the state of things are, what suggestions are. Um, yeah, or, um, I think there are a number happen. of opportunities for us to really voice our our frustration if you have if you're uncomfortable with the condition of the streets, and and document how they uh, affected your business before COVID, how important it is that we reopen with clean streets and that we, frankly, regain trust of the world. Uh, between now and the beginning of COVID, there have been so many negative uh, YouTube videos and stories about San Francisco. Like I try to do my best to let them roll off my back, but uh, they're having an impact on the rest of the world and, and our reputation here. And we all know this is a great city. We all know this is a beautiful city. We all know that the, there's, a, there's a deep underbelly 
of uh, greatness in San Francisco, but it's but it's suffering at the moment. So um, working with the chamber, working with organizations like Tipping Point, that is, um, we just had a webinar today with them and uh, another chamber event that you can pick up information. Uh, tip, tipping Point has created a dashboard and they are going uh, nerdy, science, geeky on mm. the, the, the math of homelessness, the math of how much is being spent on trying to cure homelessness and the effectiveness or the lack of effectiveness of those dollars. Um, again, we're, we have, as you know, Stephanie, a, a huge budget in San Francisco and how and where it's spent and what agencies are uh, working with each other um, are so important to try to maximize the dollars going forward because the tax collection uh, revenue for the city is going to be less uh, in the next coming years. So we've got to all learn how to work more efficiently. I'm not sure if I answered your specific question or if there was a website you want me to send people to, but but no, I think no, overall, you did. Thank you. the overall piece is that we all have to get involved in, and um, you know, explain and stress your stress your uh, opinions about how the city can be, you know, an, an ambitious goal of maybe maybe the cleanest city in the world. Uh, we that need that kind of north star compass to be able to bounce back, and everyone knows under that kind of north star what they need to do. Thank you. Any other questions out there? We'll take a couple more if we have them. Rodney, you had mentioned uh, the parkettes. Is there are is there a certain? It, it would SFMTA be the ones that would handle that, or can you? Uh, with our restaurant Credo, it's right in the heart of the financial district on Pine Street, and we're running up against a couple of times um, that access. So we're just kind of if any information you might have to yeah. illuminate on that. Thank you. Um, a gentleman named Robin Abad, and I believe Robin is with the planning department, but it's in close conjunction with uh, Department of Public uh, Parking and Traffic. And you can apply for one of those uh, parklets. You can, um, you know, find out right now. I believe there's no charge. The f there, there, there's no fee. Um, typically, it would have been you'd had to pay the replacement costs of the revenue of the parking meter. But I believe that's been temporarily waived. Hopefully, that's uh, waived indefinitely. Um, and there's, uh, as I mentioned, some uh, notion of trying to bring some permanency to some or all of those parklets, which I think would be a great idea. Thank you. All righty. Thank you for the opportunity, Mike. Thank you, Rodney. I think okay. then uh, we are done with the questions and we'll go back to networking. Thank you again for all the Thanks. time nice to see uh, for both you and Julie. All Thank right. you.